Good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be joining you today and to have this opportunity to talk to quite a different audience than I'm used to speaking to. Um, I'm a crop scientist myself and I use genome editing as a research tool in my lab. But I've been asked today to come and talk to you about genome editing in the context of plant breeding. So genome editing is the latest uh, approach to plant breeding, which allows us to literally remove, edit or introduce or replace genetic sequence at a rate much faster than traditional plant breeding methods. I will spend a bit of time talking about uh, other plant breeding methods because it helps to explain the logical process that has led to genome editing. And then we'll finish off this talk with a little discussion about where I think genome editing could potentially have an impact on the immunity sector going forward. So let's take a step back now and start off by looking at traditional plant breeding approaches. So plant breeding is all about selecting for desirable traits or genetic variation. So if we take these different vegetable types, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, what you might be less familiar with is the fact that they're all the same species. So their genetic sequence will be very similar, but small changes or mutations that have occurred have been selected for over the years to give us these different forms. So for example, a mutation from this wild type in the center, which gave rise to bigger leaves, has been selected for over time to give us kale. Mutations which led to a denser flower bud formation has given us uh, broccoli. And mutations to cabbage, which has promoted lateral side shoot formation, has given us Brussels sprouts. And what's important to note is that these uh, mutations that have been selected for have been to meet humans' needs, so for uh, yield, flavour, appearance, and not the needs of the plant. So over time, what we have lost is some of that disease resistance that these plants would naturally have had. So these vegetables are very much dependent on humans for their survival. You wouldn't go for a walk in the park, for example, and find uh, wild broccoli growing, for example. In the 1940s, uh, mutation breeding was uh, added to the plant breeders toolbox. And this is where seed or uh, tissues were exposed to chemicals or radiation in order to induce uh, random mutations throughout the plant's genome. So what's happening at the molecular level here is that uh, this exposure results in damage to the DNA. Uh, we can lose genetic sequence as a result, or more often as the cell tries to repair itself, um, our DNA is made up of these building blocks called bases, uh, which we represent in this diagram here by A, C's, T's and G's. So as a plant cell attempts to repair itself, it can recruit the wrong base and therefore we introduce an error or a mutation to that genetic sequence. Now, mutation breeding is completely random. So what it does is it introduces hundreds of thousands of mutations throughout the plant's genome. And what you hope then is that you've introduced genetic variation or introduced a new characteristic, which the plant breeder can then select from. So traditional breeding approaches rely on the fact that plants are sexually compatible and we inherit half of our genetic material from each parent. So if we want to introduce a gene, say for disease resistance from a wild type into an elite variety, as well as introducing the gene that we do want, we're going to be introducing tens of thousands of genes that we don't want. What we would then have to do is take the offspring and repeatedly back cross it to our elite line over several generations so that what we're left with is the elite genetic background with our new introduced gene. Now technologies developed in the 1980s uh, GM technology. This allowed us for the first time to be able to clone just the gene that we wanted and introduce it into our elite background. So this very much speeds up the process of traditional plant breeding. So here we can see this in reality. So this is a GM field trial and you can see that the green healthy plants are our GM variety. These contain a gene from wild potato that confers resistance to late potato blight. And the, the dead row of plants is our non-GM uh, line. Uh, 
Normally, a farmer would uh, prevent this sort of loss by the application of fungicides. So, so this really demonstrates how plant breeding can be used to provide a genetic solution to help reduce our need for chemical inputs. So that brings us on to genome editing, which we consider to be the era of precision breeding. So it allows us to get to the same end point of traditional breeding, but in a far more intelligent and precise way and a quicker way. So, for example, if we think back to mutation breeding that I've described before, this allows us to introduce hundreds of thousands of mutations randomly across the, the genome. Genome editing allows us to make specific changes to individual genes. We can also use genome editing to open up the genome at a precise location and insert or replace an existing gene. And so we can consider this the upgrade to GM technology. I'm going to focus on the first one because this is the one that we've made the most advances on to date. And the technology that is most widely used for genome editing is one called CRISPR-Cas. So CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats, um, which I'm not going to expand on and it isn't important. But essentially, it's a two component system whereby we introduce into our cell a guide RNA, which we can program to have the um, a complementary genetic sequence to the one we want to target. So we can think of this a little bit like a Google search engine where we can type in the sequence that we're looking for. Our guide then scans the genome and finds the complementary sequence and locks on. Once it's locked on, we can then direct a Cas9, which is our nuclease or molecular scissors, which causes a cut to the DNA. The cell then tries to repair itself in exactly the same way that I've described before. And what we hope to introduce then is a point mutation at that point. So I use genome editing as a research tool to gain a better understanding of which genes control which traits. For example, at John Lennon Centre, we have researchers who are interested in understanding the genes involved in pod formation. And the reason we're interested in that is because, <coughs> excuse me, um, premature pod shatter in the field is thought to result in yield losses um, which can cost the UK economy up to £160 million a year. Um, ideally, we want those seeds to stay in the pods until the farmer harvests, harvests them. So if I can home in on the genes that I think are believed to play an important role, and if I can disrupt those genes, uh, we can see whether those genes are involved in pod shatter. So what we're looking at now is genome sequence. Uh, it's quite a scary looking slide, but what this essentially means is that using some uh, fancy bit of kit, we are able to read the exact order in which these bases appear uh, in the DNA. Now, if you think back to when the first human genome was sequenced, uh, it's cost millions of pounds to sequence the first human genome. And it was a real global effort involving uh, multiple labs. We're now able to sequence, um, we could sequence your genome for just a few thousand pounds and we could do that relatively quickly. And if this was your genome sequence, I'd be needing to show you another two and a half million pages of screenshots like this. So all that information is packed into uh, our individual cells. And we are now able to, um, we have genome sequence for the majority of, uh, of crops and access to genome sequencing is becoming readily available to the point where uh, if you have a plant that you're particularly interested in, you could get a genome sequence carried out for a couple of thousand pounds. So we can identify uh, a gene sequence. And if we wanted to disrupt that, we would design our guide RNA to target a specific region within that gene, create a cut where we hope that the plant will then attempt to repair it. We're hoping for an error to be introduced there. And this change can be enough to disrupt that particular gene. And this is what it looks like in practice. Now, what you're looking at here in the left hand picture is a cross section of a pod and where the arrows pointing is where our valve margin would uh, 
would be. So this is the point at which the pods break open to disperse the seed. You can see our gene sequence at the bottom and where we've managed to direct our nuclease, we have created a C to T mutation and a loss of a G base. So in the billions of letters that occur in the oilseed rape uh, genome, we've disrupted just two uh, bases. And this has been enough to create a loss of function of that gene so that now those pods will need to be broken mechanically rather than shattering in the field. Now, by no means is this an endpoint product. We would then need to carry out research to see uh, what the cost would be to mechanically break open those seeds. Where genome editing really comes into its own is when we want to try and target multiple copies of a gene. So, for example, in wheat, it's a complex genome. It typically contains three copies of each gene and the genetic sequence will um, change slightly between uh, those copies of the gene. So depending on how we design our guides, we can either target a single copy, two copies or three copies if we want to create a loss of function uh, mutation. And in this example here, you can see how we can significantly increase grain size by knocking out three copies of a particular gene. Now, if we look at much more complex traits, this is research that's been carried out in Spain, and they've used genome editing to create a low gluten wheat um, to make a celiac friendly bread. And they've managed to target 35 out of 45 genes that are involved in the gluten pathway. And this has resulted in 85% uh, reduction in um, uh, immunoreactivity. So I hope you can really appreciate that uh, if we wanted to achieve this through conventional mutation breeding, it would have been an impossible task to try and target specifically these amount of genes without the background noise of mutation breeding. So we can conclude that mutation via genome editing really does outperform uh, historic mutation breeding in terms of precision and efficiency. So the first genome edited crops are now reaching the marketplace. So this is an example from an American based company and they've used genome editing to disrupt two genes in order to remove trans fats from their product uh, to create healthier oils. So let's finish off by uh, looking at potential applications that could be suitable for the amenity sector. So I had a quick Google online and I did actually find a couple of research groups in America who are using CRISPR technology to edit the genomes of turf grass. One of the areas they're looking at at the moment is um, uh, editing uh, gibberellin, which is a growth hormone to uh, produce a slower growing grass. So you would be able to mow your grass uh, less frequently. Um, so this obviously has environmental impact uh, for the amenity sector. Herbicide tolerance is a very easy trait that can be engineered in. Uh, we already have herbicide tolerant oilseed rape and sunflowers, which have been produced using genome editing technology. Another area that's uh, been looked at in the crops is drought tolerance. So can we use genome editing to produce drought tolerant crops or crops that have a better water use efficiency? Could we use genome editing to uh, introduce disease resistance into our plants so that we're less reliant on chemical input? And similarly, can we breed in using genome editing insect resistance? So can we make our plants less tasty? Uh, mutation breeding is already used to create uh, different flower shape and colours, so genome editing has an obvious uh, um, potential there as well. So there's a whole host of things that this technology could hopefully be used for in the future. So I've covered quite a lot in a relatively short space of time, so I really hope that you've managed to follow this talk. And if you haven't, then the take home message that I want you to come away with if you hear the term CRISPR in the future, you can associate this as a genome editing approach and that we can use genome editing to make precise deletions or small edits to genes, or we could use genome editing to insert or replace uh, genes in our genome in a very precise way.
And all of this has been made possible because our access to affordable genome sequencing is increasing all the time. Uh, most plant species have now been uh, sequenced or will be sequenced in the next few years. Our access to genome editing technology is rapidly expanding uh, on, on a daily basis. And so we're really moving into a very exciting time of precision and intelligent plant breeding. And this really has the potential to redefine and accelerate and enhance plant breeding. And at that, I would like to thank you for your time today. <laughs>